Welcome, my name is Lise Kukkonen and this is Practitioner's Viewpoint. In this series of podcasts, I will be interviewing practitioners from different fields on how they see sedentary behavior and promotion of physical activity in their work. Today, I have the honor to introduce my guest, Jason Gutman. Jason is a Mayo Clinic certified wellness coach. He has a master's degree in exercise physiology and a certification in sports nutrition and strength and conditioning. Today, we're going to talk about how to coach someone who wants to improve their biometrics like blood sugar levels, blood pressure, blood cholesterol levels, and on top of that, improve their overall wellness, well-being via lifestyle improvements. So I am happy to introduce Jason Goodman. Welcome, Jason. Thank you for having me, Lise. So let's start with your background. Uh, why did you get interested in exercise physiology and wellness coaching? Well, that's uh, potentially a long story, but we'll, I'll give you the very short story, which um, is, is rather personal. It really started for me being an overweight teenager and the challenges that, that came with that. And uh, the challenge that, that, that came with trying to overcome that essentially on my own without uh, a really sound approach, uh, that led me to some, some real challenges with my own well-being. And it was ultimately from having to pick the pieces up from that, uh, that, I, that this passion kind of emerged uh, like a pearl under pressure. Um, I kind of had to learn um, and thankfully was already studying in this direction and I was able to combine sort of my academic interests with my personal needs. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, uh, because of that experience, uh, you are a better coach now or do you agree? Do you think so? It's a really neat scenario. I sometimes tell people when looking for a coach in, in any realm of life. Mm -hmm. uh, one neat thing to look for is someone who is has some acumen in the area you want to develop some acumen in and got there from a similar place where you're starting. So someone that wasn't a natural um, uh, is really neat because they have not only the know-how of how to go from where you were to where you want to go, but they have a lot of the um, compassion that comes along with how challenging that journey can be. I agree. Um, so my next question is actually kind of a follow-up for that. So uh, who do you work with now? Who are your clients or who is your typical client? If, if there is a typical client, because everybody's different. Sure. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a lot of individuality in what my clients bring to the table, but the commonality has a lot to do with some of what you had in your introduction of me. Uh, you know, people are having conversations with their physicians and other medical providers every day about their blood sugar levels, their blood pressure, their blood cholesterol levels, often their weight as part of these conversations. And going home, knowing that it's time to make some lifestyle improvements and not really knowing where to start, uh, not really knowing how to succeed in the long run, mm. those really are the kind of people I work with. They're, uh, they've come to a point in life where they're ready to adopt some lifestyle improvements and they're, they have enough wisdom from either trying and, and struggling in the past with these specific efforts or they're just a coachable person in general that they say, I'm, I'm going to get some help with this. I, don't, I, I know I don't need to do this by myself. Uh, that's, that's the kind of person I work with. Okay, we are later on going to touch on the, on the behavior change theories a little bit also. But um, I'd like to ask you, maybe I'm, I'm sure you have many great stories about people, you know, getting good results. Would you like to share something like maybe a story of what you have accomplished with your uh, clients? Sure, sure. There's a gentleman I'm, I'm actively working with that I think really epitomizes uh, how my work tends to go with my clients and also is a very inspiring story for a lot of people out there that have the kinds of challenges we're talking about of what really can be done with what I'm calling lifestyle improvements with sometimes what's called lifestyle medicine mm. uh, is uh, 
This gentleman is middle age, uh, financial advisor, um, father, uh, so sort of a sort of a regular guy here in the United States, mm-hmm. and uh, and has had challenges with uh, particularly his weight and his blood pressure for for some time. And what brought him to me was uh, his blood sugar was being and and, and his diagnosed type two diabetes was being managed with medication. And to make a long story short, the, he was having very unpleasant side effects and that led to some more exploration. Then he finally found himself on a medication that he didn't have any side effects with, but he was paying something like uh, five or $600 a month for the medication. That was enough for him to say, I don't want to live with these side effects. I don't want to live with $500 $500 out of pocket every month for this medication. And if I'm honest with myself, I'm really not feeling that great. Like there's more going on here than just uh, high blood sugar levels. Mm-hmm. And and there are things I want to do. There are things I want to do with my family. There's things I want to do with my career. Uh, there are hobbies that I want to be pursuing and they're getting harder to pursue. And, and, I, and I want to work on this. And so we started at the first of this year, a little, bit, little before the first of this year, and he's lost 25-ish pounds, um, which, you know, by commercial advertisements isn't that dramatic, uh, mm-hmm. but, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, really good behavior change from the mm-hmm. perspective of being able to sustain it, it's pretty outstanding. Somewhere, you know, my experience is that unless someone has an extraordinary amount of weight to lose, losing about a pound a week tends to be very sustainable. Yes. Uh, And the really remarkable change he's had are his fasting blood sugar levels. I'm not sure. This is one area I think the United States actually uses the same units as the rest of the world. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He is, uh, he is, uh, started about 210 for his fasting blood sugar levels, which is quite high. Um, and he's under 100, uh, which, which puts him in what doctors and, and medical providers call normal. He's in the, the higher end of the normal range mm-hmm. uh, and is having conversations with his physician about, uh, has been and is continuing about lowering his medication. And uh, there's, there's more work he wants to do. He, he, he wants to lose some weight. He has some symptoms that, are, that come with... Um, high blood sugar levels that he'd like to, to see if he can have fade away. Um, but this is a man that in eight or nine months uh, went from having blood sugar levels that most people would consider almost alarmingly high to blood sugar levels of a, of a 20 year old that are, that are normal. And yeah. I, I, what I, I I'll, I'll finish this anecdote by saying that, because I think this is inspiring to a lot of people. He didn't have to do anything too crazy. Um, He went from not exercising to over a number of months working up to he's now exercising four times a week for an hour. Uh, So that's not nothing. That is a significant Mm -hmm. amount of exercise, but he's not doing what many people in the public think you need to do to be well. He's not running marathons or doing triathlons or doing anything that, that we might consider extreme. And then the same thing, uh, this is slightly off topic of our conversation, but mm-hmm. the same thing with, with, his, with his eating habits. Um, he didn't have to go on an extreme rid to diet. He didn't have to cut out X for the rest of his life. Um, I would say what he's done and what my clients typically do is shift. If you think about all the food a person eats in a, in a week, for example, and we could simply label it as processed or unprocessed or processed and mm-hmm. whole natural real food. Mm. he was probably eating um, 30 or 40 percent real food and now mm. he's probably eating 70 or 80 percent real food that change is often enough to really make a significant those two changes and you know there are other aspects of of well-being outside of food and movement but if a person goes from sedentary to moderately active and goes from eating a, a, a high percentage of processed food to a low percentage of processed food Uh, a lot of good stuff tends to happen. I think it's a great example. And um, quite often what drugs do is they mimic the effect that we can have on uh, raising 
the levels of physical activity and uh, improving nutrition. So it's it's just like mm, maybe at first you get quicker results with drugs, but in the long run it's not a good solution. It's it's a great great example. So you know there's so much information nowadays available about about wellness and how to be have a better health. So what do you think are people struggling about mostly? Like because in, in wellness is not it's not only exercise and physical activity and nutrition there is stress levels and sleep recovery mm-hmm. it it compounds so many uh, factors so what's your uh, opinion ex- experience what are the struggling points i think one of the primary struggling points is simply uh, feeling like a, a person feeling like they don't have enough time or energy that they're they're being pulled in many other directions and so that's where we sort of start to traverse the gap between individual behavior and sort of like cultural norms. Um, so it's 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 very hard for someone in a society that's that could be characterized as busy, mm-hmm. um, uh, where you know work hours are it's are commonly long, uh, where it's common for uh, families to have both parents working. Um, and then have a lot of household and parenting responsibilities to do in a truncated period of time. Um, so, you know, and I, I, I say this not to, uh, uh, I often tell my clients, I'm reflecting back to them something from their real life. And I say, I'm not saying this to make an excuse for you, because I would be the worst wellness coach in the world if what I was doing are making excuses for you. But 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 making that real, I think, is important. Um is uh, so I'm not in the business of, of changing cultural norms. I'm in the business of working with an individual. And one thing that will often come up though, is, you know, we're having conversations about their values mm-hmm. and, um, and because they're in my office, we're having conversations about their values around well-being. And the more a person, person explores their values around well-being and why it's important for them to improve their well-being they start to think differently about how they spend their time and energy. Mm. And so it's, it's interesting in that holistic sense that sometimes the solution to helping someone exercise more isn't a strategic exercise plan. It's them discovering that what they want to do with their life is work 5% less or work 10% less um, because things like exercising and getting enough sleep and spending time with their close ones it is becoming more of a priority. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think that, that the time energy challenge is a big one. So, yeah, um, sometimes I guess all of us might come across to where we, we kind of compare our values and then how much time do we use on these values? I might have health or family might be my number one values. But then when I look at my calendar, you know, <laughs> the, the, the the time might go somewhere else. So this is a conflict. So I think mm. it's just working with this. Do you get the time and the values correlating at least a bit better? So well said. And, you know, using that gentleman I was talking about earlier, that's been a big part of his realizations. You know, he would, he would start, start saying to me, uh, you know, because he's a, he's a very principled man. So he could easily say, my family is important to me. And he could easily say, my financial advising practice is important to me. And what he started to be able to say is my well-being is important to me. And started to put them on more of an equal playing field, and and that's that's where many people find themselves. Most people don't, thankfully, say that's it. I'm quitting my job uh, to <laughs> yeah. to exercise full time and to prepare my meals and and all of this. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just starting to put it maybe on that on that equal footing. And I, you know, I think. Unfortunately, this is an aspect of human nature, and it certainly has been part of my experience, is that 
uh, pain is a is a teacher or at least an attention getter. Mm. And uh, so it often is a a challenging situation of some kind that helps a person start to level out those values. Yeah, definitely. Um, so next, I'd really like to talk about um, behavior change a little bit and this idea to talk about automatic effective evaluations and reflective attitude in motivation actually came from you. And uh, I really want to thank you for that. It's a great topic. Uh, so most of the exercise promotion or physical activity prom promotion relies on the self-determination theory. Uh, where the goal is kind of like to give people more knowledge and then to expect that they would change their behavior based on that new knowledge. But uh, it is a really slow process. And the research today shows, though, that uh, we have two dimensions and or systems uh, that guide our behavior. And there is also this much quicker automatic effective evaluation. So that's all quite complicated. <laughs> so okay. would you like to open these two concepts up to our listeners a little bit, um, maybe in a, a bit easier way? Sure. And I think one way to to unpack them is to share a quick another quick anecdote. And then maybe we can, for some of the listeners, get into the more of the scientific terminology around it, but but this is this is a story that talks about that describes this in layperson's terms, and this comes from a local physician that I have a professional relationship with, where he'll refer his patients to me, and I'll refer my clients to him, and uh, he's a strong proponent of lifestyle medicine, so he will be using lifestyle medicine in his practice. Simply doesn't have as much time to go deep on wellness coaching and, mm. and spend time with people. And he said to me one day in frustration, and we were talking specifically about exercise that Jason, I think I do the similar, similar kind of things as you do. I ask similar kind of questions. I'm leaning on the same kind of behavior change techniques. Um, but I'm, but I'm struggling to, uh, to get people to exercise. And uh, what he couldn't see what he was that he was, and I asked him to tell me more, you know, how will a conversation go with a patient of yours when you're uh, trying to get them to exercise, to exercise or exercise more. And he shared along the lines of, of what you introduced least, which is he would lean heavily on information. Mm -hmm. He would um, show them their biometrics. He would uh, show them, what that risk, you know, the risk categories they were in for developing certain ailments. Uh, and he would show them the scientific evidence of uh, how powerful exercise is in reversing this. And, you know, what I've found is that physicians, especially because they're so well educated, mm. uh, lean on even uh, to use a slightly negative term, even worship information. Mm. Um, and, and that's true of academics. It's true of any of us that consider ourselves intelligent people or rational thinkers. And there's certainly a place for all of that. But I know this gentleman well. And so what, the way I answered his question was, because uh, I know that what he does is he's an avid he, player of ultimate Frisbee in the summertime, and he's an avid downhill skier in the wintertime. So I said to him, and it was summertime when we were talking, I said, when you get out of the office today and you enthusiastically rush over to ultimate frisbee are you do you tell yourself i'm going to go play ultimate frisbee so that i don't get dementia 30 years from now <laughs> or do you go cuz you love the people there and you love being outside and and you love the sport itself and that's an introduction into this concept of automatic affective evaluations and reflective attitude he decided to go play ultimate frisbee that day and, he, and regularly based on what psychologists call an automatic affective evaluation, which is um, overly fancy language for doing something that feels good, <laughs> Do, doing something that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you alluded to um, or you, you mentioned that uh, that's a faster decision making process. Mm -hmm. um, it's also built into the name. It's also an automatic 
decision process. So many people are familiar with the idea of having uh, conscious thoughts and unconscious thoughts. These could be thought of as unconscious thoughts. Mm. Now, the beauty of, of that in behavior change is that unconscious thoughts are quick, fast. Um, a neuroscientist would call them efficient, meaning they, mm. use, they don't use a lot of energy. Mm. Um, and so if you can help a person tap into fast, efficient, powerful decision-making process, what you're bypassing is the need to rely on uh, sort of willpower. And we can think of willpower as an exhaustible resource. Willpower is useful. We, we all use it every day uh, to, to help get us to do certain things. And imagine that we start the week with $700 in willpower and start each day with $100 in willpower if we don't overuse it. We all know the feeling of uh, it being harder to make a positive choice at five o'clock in the afternoon than at 10 o'clock in the morning mm. or on Friday evening compared to Monday morning. That's running out of willpower. That's the, the resource being exhausted. Whereas if the habit we're trying to form is tied to something that we deeply enjoy or, and I'm, I think we'll probably get into this, uh, enjoy a little bit or at least don't find miserable, mm. we, use, we spend less of those willpower dollars um, and and then maintain them in our willpower bank account to to use throughout the week. Um, so I think that's a that's a good introduction to the to the concept. Definitely, yeah. So uh, do you think that um, the techniques we use today in coaching uh, uh, do you think that they um, rely on both of these systems, or do we only use uh, the reflective? Uh, system. You, I think it's, I, it's... I, I also I have just one. one I think that um, as you said about the doctors who you know have all the knowledge, I think also that in in the physical activity or exercise business, most of the people who are uh, you know giving services or producing these services, they have a really positive feeling right. about physical activity and exercise, and they tend to think that everybody gets the same feedback. So. How do you see these? <laughs> My comments, yeah. Yeah, I think that's it's it's a that's a really uh, helpful observation. Is I think there are a handful of challenges, and one is the over reliance on information that we've talked mm -hmm. about a little bit, and that's out there. I think um, that's like I said, that's heavy in uh, the medical world. It's heavy in the academic world. What's a little more heavy in the the, the fitness world um, is sort of the, you, you've heard people say, no pain, no gain. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people in the fitness world, yes, do have a, a great enjoyment of exercise. Also, it's a, it's a lot of athletes um, and a lot of people who've been conditioned in that no pain, no gain kind of space. And... Um, so I think the, all, all of that um, has its place, but generally works against using the power of automatic effective evaluations, um, which I found more and more and more to be more and more and more powerful. And I'll give an example of this way this plays out. So you know, my job when someone is sitting across from me is to draw out their motivation. And, and my ultimate job is to help them achieve, uh, achieve their wellness goals and form the wellness habits that they want to form. And so there's a pressure on a professional, whether you're a physician or a fitness trainer or a wellness coach, uh, to have change happen, uh, to, have, to have improvement happen. So it's tempting having been an athlete myself, have definitely, you know, been immersed in the no pain, no gain ethos, mm -hmm. um, being armed with plenty of information to lean on that. But what I know from experience is that my results with my clients won't be durable. If I pressure them, essentially, or the word a psychologist might use is coerce them with information or the sort of no pain, no gain mi mindset. That would be with questions of, 
don't you want it bad enough? Or um, can't you put up with some struggle now so you can fit in those pants that you want to fit into, <laughs> right? Um, that can get that person to do that hard workout they're facing mm -hmm. in the next 45 minutes, but it helps them develop a less favorable relationship with exercise. And I say 10 times a day, at least the word sustainable. To me, I'm not doing my job if I don't set someone up for really long-term, really lasting success. I think that uh, self-care skills, learning to eat well, learning to exercise well, learning to take care of ourselves in general is something that all of us have in us and all of us can learn. And the way I look at wellness coaching is using that ancient expression, I don't give people fish, I teach them how to fish. Um, I, I really think that any adult who's ready to learn this in three months or six months or nine months or a year can, can learn how to do this without that pressure, that coercion. Um, they, they can learn to do it consistently. And uh, so I think it's a mixed bag uh, in our communities. I think, um, wellness coaching is emerging as a field and, uh, self people are becoming more aware of behavior change, um, theories like self-determination theory, behavior change is becoming part of pop culture with some of these books that are bestsellers now, like tiny habits. And I, I can't remember all the names mm -hmm. and people are starting to think more about how to work smarter, not harder, with this kind of stuff and how to work with themselves instead of against themselves. And, and that's largely how I see utilizing automatic effective evaluations as a way of making decisions is it's using something within a person um, that is automatically motivating when you can tap into it. And I, I know I'm, I'm going on, I'll tie this in a bow by saying, cause you asked an important question. It sounds Nice. It sounds, uh, and, I, and some people listening could say it sounds too good to be, it could even sound too good to be true. So the way this works in the real world is no, I don't, someone doesn't sit across from me for our first wellness session. And I say, uh, what kind of exercise do you love? And they don't all come up with an answer right away. <laughs> um, in fact, the, a common first answer is what they hate. Um, but that's helpful because, uh, the, there's a, sometimes people think they need to do what they hate. And when someone starts to say, I hate running, it hurts my knees. I just hate running. That's information. And, and I'll have a follow-up question. So what's, what's something that might give you some positive benefits of exercise that wouldn't be like running at all. And that gives them permission to answer a question that they're often not asked because they've, they've really been thought, been thinking, been conditioned to think that it needs to be painful in some way, either physically painful or, or boring or something. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but when it, it open, it starts to open the door to this question, they might say, well, well, I've always loved to, to hike in the woods, but you know, will that help? You know, they, they question. And then you can, that's a nice place to ask their permission to add some, some education and share with them, you know, pull, pull a piece of data out that people who walk, 30 minutes a day, four times a week, you see improvements. And, um, and then they start to have an intersection between the information that is useful and, oh, so there's something that that's beneficial. And yeah, if I knew I could hike in the woods with my dog and that would help me lower my blood sugar levels, I think I could do that. Um, so it's, it's, it's not about somebody going from sedentary and with a mindset that they hate exercise to exercising four times a week and loving it. It's about incremental steps, you know, finding small openings to something they, they might enjoy. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, definitely. I couldn't agree more with you that taking these small steps and I guess um, this is the way also to build because I do have this positive uh, automatic effective reflection or kind of like a response uh, this develops with time am i correct and uh, so you know starting to get this positive feedback you need to take small steps how long have you how or how long 
do you think it takes for people to change this maybe negative response that they've had about physical activity or exercise into a positive you know it depends on the person i think mm. you can you can get openings almost immediately um but i think most people within three to six months can can go from even being sedentary to exercise being something that they look forward to in their day might not be their favorite thing uh, ever or you might not be yet but it might but it's something that they look forward to and they enjoy the, the feelings associated with it and um there are a lot of sort of levers a, a coach or other professional can push so um you can explore do you enjoy exercising outside or inside um, and people sometimes have very strong feelings about that um, you can ask them do you enjoy exercising by yourself with a partner or in a group and people often have very strong feelings about that um, and then we're starting to put two things to a couple of things together right because if a person says they get some enjoyment out of the act of walking and they get a lot of enjoyment about exercising with a partner now when now they've they're they're um, amplifying that reference experience so they they go for a walk in the woods on a beautiful day with a friend it simply felt good and it goes into that older part of our brain as i like that um and when they come to the next time when they're thinking about going for a walk a few days later they remember unconsciously that they liked it and of course each time that happens it's it's deeper and deeper so that's my that would be my encouragement to professionals working to motivate people to exercise is uh, double down on helping people make it fun. It can, it can, it can't be too much fun. So even if someone's developing a hiking in the woods habit with a friend and they come in for their third or fourth session with me, I'll ask an open-ended question. Like, can you think of any ways to make hiking even more fun? Uh, and you know, it, the answer will come from the person, but they might say, so far, I've only used the trail in my neighborhood, but I'm starting to feel fitter. And I've always wanted to hike some of the mountains in the western part of the state. Uh, that would be really exciting to to maybe work up to being able to do one of those. Um, so I just think that's a really, really good question is how can you make this more enjoyable? Hmm. I, I agree with you on that. People, of, at least when I see people... Uh, I'm, I'm a physiotherapist, so quite often I have a feeling that people think that to get good results, you have to go to the gym four times a week and then you have to run a marathon. So these, I don't know if it comes from marketing or, you know, from where do people get the idea that uh, a positive health effect would need like a full time athlete's life so i think this is a belief that i sometimes struggle with it's uh not realistic to think that somebody who's been sedentary would in a short period of time turn into an athlete mm -hmm. do you see that oh i i you work with i talk about it often and i don't know how much it spans cultures uh but i often talk about in the united states we have two large groups of people. We have a we have millions and millions and millions of sedentary people. And we have a few million people who do the things we're talking about, marathons, triathlons, CrossFit. And they're what are celebrated in every form of pop culture as a happy, healthy person, a fit person. That person is living a wellness lifestyle. And this is from a behavior change perspective, this creates a big problem because um, what you want in behavior change are small gaps. That creates a very, very, very large gap. And um, it's super, that, and that's a, it's a deep cultural, cultural thing. We have a saying here in the States, go big or go home. Mm -hmm. um, so when people think they want to do something, I want to get in shape, I want to start a business. Um, there's a lot of, pull toward, well, just having a business that would uh, make you a living and help you sustain your family and would be enjoyable and beneficial to your community. That's not enough. Like you got to be, you got to be the next Bill Gates, right? 
Um, and, and people feel the same thing around, around fitness that, uh, someone could be in a, in a pretty regular position. They have 20 or 30 pounds to lose. Um, their biometrics are, um, not alarming, but they're starting to rise. And that's the, the switch that often flips for that person is, well, now it's time to, to run a marathon. Um, and for some people that works for others, it's, uh, too much psychologically. And as a physiotherapist, I'm sure you see this. It's often too much, uh, physiologically. Um, and, and that's a challenge too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As a, in my work, I see that this, um, I think it's sometimes in media, it's, uh, you know, we've all re- we've all been reading these stories where somebody ran like an ultra marathon with two months of exercise or, you know, something like this, or just, um, and I think these are not such great stories because usually it, it really, they forgot to mention that the same person maybe was an athlete like years ago, or they usually have a background, a really athletic background. And then there might be maybe a few years of more, you know, passive life, but it's because it's, almost impossible to run a, an ultra marathon if you've been sedentary your whole life in a few months. And and this is something that is quite often uh, forgotten. And then I, I sometimes see people who want to do the same, but uh, the starting point is actually not equal to somebody else. So mm. um, there is sometimes this gap of information that you wouldn't see in a media article. Mm, and and oh, it's very true. And there's there's a couple of pieces of information that I think are helpful for a person if they're ready, uh, sort of ready to hear them. Um, the one that that you might be familiar with is that people are people in the general public are extremely surprised. And I didn't know this. This this when I was um, teenager and in my early twenties, and I was really overdoing exercise. That was part of the the problem I was talking about at the time. But people aren't aware. There's robust scientific evidence that exercising at the very high levels is not only unhealthy, it's as unhealthy as being sedentary. And I'd be glad to to share that kind of, it really is uh, what researchers call a U-shaped curve. So being sedentary and doing marathons every year is associated with a level of well-being and longevity. And the bottom of the U, where the where the best well being is, is uh, something like three to four, five hours a week of of, of moderate exercise, um, which is just such an antidote to that pull to the extreme. Uh, so here's that's what I why I I have a lot of passion around this concept um, because it's part of my personal life. It was, you know, I, I've experienced the overdoing it and the, the damage that, that comes from that. Um, number two, it's not even necessary. And then number three, it prevents a major behavior change challenge. Um, the second piece of, I, I suppose, data that's really helpful, you're probably familiar with the popular book and the whole concept of the blue zones. Um, these are the places on earth with the longest living people. I think there's, I think there's five zones. And, um, when you look at the lifestyle of these folks, um, they're not even doing what we call exercise. Uh, I, if I remember reading right, um, many of these cultures don't have a word that we would, they, they don't have a word in their language that is like exercise. They, if I remember right, one of them has a word in their language that the best translation is something like community walk. And so they view it more as a break from work and being together. They don't view it as getting your heart rate up and um, breaking down your muscles so you can build it back up. Those are um, concepts, to, to some, some Western culture concepts, um, which, is int- which is relevant to our conversation because a community walk sounds nice. Um, mm. Uh, right. And uh, yeah. yeah, I'd like to break, get there. Yeah. <laughs> the idea yeah. that, all right, it's time for you to improve your your well-being. What we're going to do, you know, the, this is me putting on my exercise physiologist hat is we're going to break down your muscle. And here I'm going to show you a picture of a broken down muscle cell and then it's going to build back stronger. And that's how you're going to uh, improve your well-being. 
to a to a well adjusted person, that doesn't sound that nice. Right? Like, <laughs> uh, uh, now, you know, of course, the, you know, that's happening, even if we're not uh, deliberately doing that, or if we're not overdoing that. Um, but uh, I think that the way the attitudes are in these cultures, and they're getting the well being results that we in the West want, um, are are some solid evidence that we don't need to be we don't need to be no pain no gaining it. Mm, definitely, yes, and uh, and the other, you know, you have told, you have said a lot that we should enjoy what we do when it comes to physical activity and exercise. I think there is another theory that, uh, you know, if you 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 have a, a physical mm, activity routine or exercise, and you feel that you can develop in it or get better you know, Excel, that's also a good theory, which is more sustainable than just like burning calories approach. Sure. So that's something I, I hope the science will look into more in the future also. I'd like to see that too, Lisa. That's very interesting. I hadn't really explored that concept that we might call mastery, you know, getting mm, better yeah, at something yeah. as, as being motivating. What I will say is, uh, I see some of the opposite effect of that happening. So in a lot of sports cultures, there's sort of a mindset of, uh, I'll, I'll say this way this plays out with a client. I'll ask a client, um, what do you enjoy? And a, a not uncommon answer will be, I really like to play racquetball, but I'm not very good at it. And there's a cultural message, at least here, that, If you're not good at it, that's kind of embarrassing. So don't do that thing. Mm -hmm. um, whereas presenting it as an opportunity to learn something that you could get good at um, is another way of looking at these kind of things. Because and and to me, from my perspective, um, for the right person, even dismissing that idea that you have to be good at something in order to enjoy it and mm -hmm. and get the benefits of it. What I'm trying to say is it that sometimes there's an excessive pressure to be good at things. Um, and sometimes that's not necessary. Definitely. Yeah. I, I totally see that it can be demotivating also, but maybe there's different people. That's right. uh, sometimes it can also be like, for example, we can maybe like dancing, you have a dancing course and you are actually learning something. So it doesn't feel like exercise, even though it is exercise. Right. right. So, um, when we're just like little by little coming to an end of our conversation. So uh, you have had great success with your clients and uh, many of our listeners are physical activity researchers, but also a lot of healthcare professionals and fitness professionals. Uh, what is your advice? How to uh, get good results with your clients? That's a, that's a great question. And I think, um, the concise answer I would offer is delve into some of this behavior change information. Um, some of the popular books are helpful. Uh, Self-determination theory has a nonprofit website loaded with practical information and loaded with all the papers that support their theory. Um, and you're probably familiar with uh, motivational interviewing. Mm. I would encourage any wellness or medical professional who's interested in helping people with behavior change to start with a course, maybe a weekend course, uh, work your way up. Um, it's a very, very, very powerful way to make self-determination theory and other behavior change theories real. Uh, I think of motivational interviewing as bringing Those, all those theories to life. They give you very practical tools for, for bringing them to life. Um, I think that's a, that's a good starting point for a lot of people. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, if some of our listeners would like you, you know, to reach you, um, and do you do online consulting? Where do you, um, you know, where is your practice and how could people reach you if they want to? With the miracle of technology these days, I do both. So I have a, a old fashioned local office here in, uh, in South Portland, Maine, in the United States. And I also work with people via Zoom. So I, I can 
I can work with anyone anywhere. Oh, that's great to hear. And I, um, I really encourage our uh, listeners to follow you on, on social media. I personally enjoy your posts. They're very informative. And um, we will have information about how to find you attached to the description of this podcast. So, Jason, I'd really like to thank you for joining us today. And um, I would also like to thank all of our listeners. And uh, we will be back next week with a new guest. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me, Lise.